today. Welcome everyone. I'm Dick Perrin. Uh, I have been involved with the McKenna Foundation and the uh, McKenna Lecture for many, many years now with the folks out of Arizona State University. And it's a pleasure to have you join us today for our interactive discussion session. And I thought first I would put up some slides that were from Dennis Cortez's presentation on Tuesday. For those of you who heard it, it gave us a great foundation for today's interactive discussion. And so I'm going to take a moment and just sort of go through the, the slides briefly. We really are talking today about future requirements for building a secure healthcare system and the lessons learned from the pandemic. This really includes the coordination of, of emergency healthcare systems capabilities across the country, across the county, across a specific region in the country and providing adequately trained staff and resources for the care requirements and dealing with people who have come down with that dread disease, the COVID. So the strategic objectives in terms of our efforts this afternoon are to really talk mostly about facilities, how we structure facilities and what the impacts have been from the pandemic on changing the structure of facilities and changing the approach to securing facilities so that we can maintain uh, safe and effective healthcare for patients who really require inpatient care as well as access from outside. If we look at the goals of the program overall in terms of the symposium and the uh, process, we're looking at how we discuss these issues, certainly with health departments, as well as with hospitals and, and the ambulatory care providers as well. Longer term considerations. I put this slide in from the presentation on Tuesday because I think the whole issue of ongoing coordination, ongoing organization for healthcare responsiveness to emergencies is really important for us to take and learn as much as we can about the issues that we've encountered during the past year with dealing with the pandemic. And of course, the research and educational links. Hospital operations, workforce readiness, some things that are really important in terms of dealing with the things going forward for dealing with the issues of the pandemic related responses across the county, across the states, across clinics, vaccination process, and how and where to engage state and local health departments. So with that, I'm going to put this slide up and, and take a few minutes to just give you a moment to read this while we go over and ask our two uh, participants today who are contributing perspectives from their background and experience. I have the pleasure of having Cindy Crump on the phone with us or on the presentation with us and Cindy has worked at, at DHA facilities and up at Fort Detrick and certainly is currently working now with Expression Networks on telemedicine and related things in terms of technology to support things and certainly the site certifications and credentialing. And Ben Rook, who has been involved with, with architecture for many, many years. And uh, when we talked previously about his background and experience, it was with uh, some of the things that he'd done with Johns Hopkins and the Sheikh Saeed uh, tower, the replacement facilities at Johns Hopkins Health System and the East Bayview uh, Medical Center campus with all the research facilities. And he's continued to do his work across the country with many, many academic medical centers. With that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Cindy and let Cindy give you some background on, on her experiences and her perspectives on the topic for today. Cindy? Yes, so while the future is virtual, actually today, um, the present is virtual too. Um, we continue to press the envelope in delivering more virtual services. Over the last year, I think there's been an increase of about 60 plus percent in the use of virtual capabilities in delivery of care. Um, in the case of the work that my team is engaged on with um, the DOD, as well as HHS, the National Emergency Telecritical Care Network, we are involved in the National Emergency Telecritical Care Network, or NETSIM for short. And the concept there um, that the DOD and HHS has, have advocated for a 21st century national disaster medical system is uh, delivery of virtual care from remote clinical experts to local facilities. Um, many cases, those are critical access hospitals or underserved rural areas that need additional support for COVID surge. So 
thinking of the concept of facilities now, we're looking at virtual care at home, perhaps in a quarantine situation with monitoring. We're looking at virtual wards of patients being managed by a panel that is remotely managing cases and virtual ICUs. Um, we had an implementation, um, our first implementation of this concept in Puerto Rico for a critical access hospital, um, where our uh, team and services include applications, analytics that were generated by the clinical records, and staffing by remote intensivists and then ICU nurses who were helping on-site staff, perhaps who had never had to adjust an, a ventilator or learning how to present a patient in working with the, those um, staff and personnel to uh, manage a case uh, remotely and also um, educate and support the local staff in developing their skills and standards. We used uh, and worked with the Society for Critical Care Managers who, who um, provided clinical practice guidelines and best practices to give the hospital staff the coaching they need for patient care. Um, we've, we are focused on delivering medical command and control at a, at a national level to support all of the uh, remote providers and uh, facilities that need support and know where are the hot spots, can we predict where supplies may be needed? Um, certainly not just for COVID, but of course in the post-pandemic world of other disasters, this gives us um, a very important um, worked example for future delivery of virtual care. Um, that includes um, building a um, infrastructure that is cyber secure, end-to-end um, -end security using zero trust in layered security to support these facilities and uh, to deliver care in the places that need it most with perhaps the least or low medically resourced um, requirements from anywhere to anywhere. In the, and that is the vision for the uh, national emergency Cindy, uh, care Cindy, your yes. volume continues to fade in and out. I don't know if it's because you're moving the mic or you're, you're maybe speak a little bit closer to it, maybe, please. I'm sorry. I guess, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So the idea is virtual care, but within a cybersecure infrastructure that is cloud-based with end-to-end -end, um, security in a... Um, uh, within a, an overall network. So maybe we lost Cindy. Ben, maybe, it, it, would you like to step in and provide some background on your experiences and your perspectives, please? Yes, it's been interesting over the last uh, two to three years watching the evolution of the academic medical centers uh, in this regard. And I'm currently located in the Carolinas and um, as you all know, we have many hurricanes. So a hurricane in terms of preparation for it uh, is not so dissimilar from what we've been going through uh, with COVID. So many of the institutions along the East Coast and particularly the Southeast uh, have uh, many things in place that other parts of the country don't. I thought I would begin just from a facility point of view discussing quickly on-campus initiatives as well as off-campus initiatives of what the large academic medical centers are doing. So um, let's just sort of take it from the patient's point of view arriving to the site. So parking decks now, the definition of a parking deck has really changed. Um, many of our clients are taking one level of a, of a parking deck now and assembling that and designing that as a containment area or a potential uh, containment area. So they are uh, increasing floor to floor heights from 12.6 normally to what now even 16 feet uh, to enable flaps to come down on a, on a deck on the top level and uh, being able to use it as a large surge uh, containment area before people even enter a hospital. And obviously only the sickest of the sick will even go to the medical center campuses, but I'm just speaking of the campus in, in general. Another interesting trend uh, is uh, going from that containment area to an emergency room. Um, you know, in the old days, and I'll say three years ago, uh, we would just do canopies at the uh, 
emergency entrances, but now all of these canopies are fitted with uh, 100 percent outside air and flaps that uh, that too serves as a greatly expanded vestibule. So only the sickest of the sick can even go in the doors uh, of the ED. Uh, those are two interesting uh, trends that have been very easy to adapt, but have made a huge difference to the large academic medical centers because uh, for patient, patients who are being transferred to the campuses, for them to be able to park in the garage, go through the containment unit, go through the checkpoint before they go in has helped out tremendously. So that's uh, pretty much what is going on uh, as it relates to the emergency entrance. So the visitors' entrances uh, still contain its impor important. So all canopies now are being fitted with flaps, 100% outside air, uh, so people can be contained before they go in. But the most recent one that's interesting, and Dick and I were touching on this a little bit, back in the, um, oh, let's just say the early 2000s or the end of the 1900s, AGVs were very important. Those are automated guided vehicles that would distribute goods from central warehouses throughout the hospital system. And then that went out of favor uh, in the 2000s and, and really up until recently because of the cost. But the manufacturers now have come back with systems that are based on what the automotive industry is doing now, AGVs that... Uh, can work within existing facilities. So the largest of the large are um, not even touching supplies when it gets uh, to the hospital. So the theory is that from the central warehouse, everything goes on a case cart or an exchange cart or some package cart. The AGV uh, picks it up on the truck. Uh, the truck then transports to the to the loading dock, uh, the AGV takes it off the loading dock and then transports it over the river through the woods, uh, through these large academic medical centers to the point of destination and then drops it off. And not a person touches any, any of the goods from that entire distribution network from the warehouse all the way through. So we're doing that at one facility right now um, that had a interstitial space, which has been easy uh, to work through, but others are trying to do that. And so I see that as being a, a mega trend from a su supply and distribution point of view, because as you know, there are two issues with supplies. Number one, getting them, and then number two, getting them in and through to the right destination without people, so many people touching them. So that is definitely a trend that uh, will continue. Um, then inside uh, the facility, the things that everybody is doing now, and I'm sure all of you run into some of this, um, all the waiting rooms have uh, containment units. It all have 100% outside air, glass dividers. Uh, staff, you know, uh, three years ago, the word was we, we want no separation between staff and patients. We want it to be hotel-like, every meter greeters, all of this. Well, all of that has been washed away, and separation now is critical. So the trick is how do you protect the staff uh, from potential contaminants uh, without infecting one another? Uh, and then in the patient care areas, uh, all of our clients are going to universal rooms, all of which, even retrofitting uh, so a thousand bed medical center to where all of their rooms will be 100% outside air. Now they don't, uh, they will not cut all these units on, meaning uh, electronically they will not activate it. But they're investing in the money and so, with, with some of the money and some of these. Uh, COVID initiatives through the feds will reimburse the clients from, for doing that, which has been very successful uh, in our area. So the patient care units are all going 100% outside air, so everything can be flushed and uh, universal rooms. Then on the MEP side, um, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, uh, everything's HEPA filtered, everything's UV lights, everything's 100% outside air and the entire hospital is uh, is able to flush itself out, uh, which is really kind of remarkable. Uh, then external, 
external to the campuses from a preventative perspective what we see going on with our clients anyway is uh, everyone's partnering with others to find central uh, ambulatory locations shopping centers black boxes that have been uh, unoccupied and uh, they're setting up uh, the potential mechanically and electrically to have huge uh, containment areas. So these are being done in community centers. So Dallas is doing it all over the city of Dallas, and uh, we're doing a couple here in the Carolinas. Charlotte uh, is involved in that heavily. And uh, it's no different than really what we've been doing for the hurricanes through all the years, except for the 100% outside air criteria. So in effect, if anybody that was in the military, it would be just setting up, uh, uh, you know, just sort of a bivouac, medevac uh, situation, helipads, and everybody just gets uh, connected to. In those facilities, we're doing wall-to-wall uh, monitors and large TV stations um, and large TV uh, facilities so that, uh, Cindy mentioned virtually, but anything virtual from the time... Um, a patient leaves their home and comes to one of these centers, they are monitored on the screen. So when the uh, patient arrives, all the staff is there and prepared to receive them, and they've already done their workups uh, coming in. But the let's, shopping let's centers... Talk, let's talk for a moment, Ben, if we could. Yes, Cindy, Cindy's got sure. some, some thoughts in terms of some of the pieces. Good. I would really like to have her uh, add Absolutely. some comments in terms of the telemedicine linkages and the issues of having people pull up to the front of a facility and dial in before they even walk into the facility. And I think also, uh, Cindy, I think you you have done a lot of work in terms of wearables and, and remote devices and remote monitoring and how that ties into pulling people into the healthcare system from the outside. Cindy? Yes, well, that is, uh, if you can hear me, um, yes. that is related to um, the idea of uh, virtual care quarantining at home and understanding and monitoring those people, um, the individuals to understand the medical common operating picture of panels of patients that might be recuperating at home and then understanding early warning signals that may uh, infer the fact that they need to move to a virtual ward to be monitored more closely um, with um, round the clock support in a step down ward or if they need to go and be admitted based on their um, vitals and other information from surveys, validated surveys, from a potentially audio signals of their cough, um, be able to use um, different logic to understand if that patient is decompensating and needs to come in, and then making sure there's a place for that patient and potentially transferring them between critical access hospitals or community hospitals to um, tertiary facilities or other facilities where they need um, a higher level of care. So that is the idea of the virtual critical care network, that it is a seamless anywhere to anywhere across the U.S. Um, for, from low resourced areas to higher resourced areas to provide capacity virtually from physicians and, and nurse ICU nurses to local staff that need additional support during a surge, as well as to managing that patient and load balancing that patient across um, different facilities or transferring that patient if the need is greater um, by monitoring that patient and managing that transfer, looking at where capacity is, routing the patient in the right place from referring to receiving. Um, so that is the comprehensive vision of, of where this will go. And, and in a crawl, walk, run fashion, the first step is supporting hospitals in surge conditions. I hope you heard that um, my um, audio has been coming in and out. Is that okay? Cindy, I think that was great. I think that one of the things that comes to mind there that both you and Ben had been talking about was the changes in terms of the interface to the inpatient or the outpatient facilities. And I know that you're, you're going to have to leave us momentarily, but would you take a moment and, and share some thoughts and perspectives on how you see the future evolving with the uh, continued use of telemedicine and certainly wearable devices and the outreach to track patient care? Yes, the idea um, linking it all together, as I think you were inferring, is care coordination across the continuum. 
and uh, the need to use, whether it's wearables, whatever the patient may have, um, starting where they are, um, potentially developing home kits that have more sophisticated uh, devices that might be needed for that patient, making it easy for that patient to plug into the network, um, providing a care record that uh, can be transferred or seamless across um, the um, facilities that, that uh, support that patient. And, and that is being realized in many uh, of the models that, that we hear here. Um, it's just doing that on a more national basis in, in emergency settings and ensuring the infrastructure and the interoperability of the medical records, interoperability and the management of the data, the cybersecurity that's in place to support that end to end in a, in a zero trust um, framework. There's, there is a lot of, uh, of um, technology infrastructure, but also process and support that's required to deliver that. It's providing training to uh, nurses and uh, physicians who may not be as familiar with uh, telehealth, though, although in the last year, that's probably less the issue than it was. Um, we probably have a natural experiment that has happened that we can use uh, to really help us uh, continue to push the envelope in delivering virtual care. But it's going from more primitive methods like remote patient monitoring for chronic care, but realizing those same technologies can be leveraged more in more sophisticated manners to deliver ICU level care in the virtual in a virtual hospital, um, and that's a concept you know that that really is um, uh, uh, the result of a lot of the work over the last year. I mean, there's been certainly tele ICU capabilities before that, but they were um, very fixed facility and high end. Um, and now we're looking at how do we deliver ICU level care on the mobile phone. So building off of that and going back to, to Ben, I think your comments were on the changes in the entrance into the facilities, emergency rooms and the rest of it. And I think there are some questions in the chat mode that people have been asking about how do we establish standards for uh, patient movement, for uh, visitors and friends movement, as well as the staff and how do we fold that all into the systems. And Cindy just talked about moving everything to the outside interface. And when I think about that from your perspective, Ben, how do you see facilities today changing in terms of their investment going forward to provide for the interface to the institution from the outside? Thank you, Cindy. Well, uh, the battleships that have to receive the intensive patients are really battening down the hatches with all of the items that I mentioned before, they also are working with uh, statewide systems using what was the old smart card technology and now converting that to apps uh, to where all the technology that was related to the smart cards now can be done with the apps so that when someone appears at um, one of these containment units, they just scan that or they scan their smart card or they uh, press their app. And uh, by the time they walk in the door, as Cindy said, the staff has already uh, knows what the workups are and what they need to be doing. And they can either send them to the battleship or send them home with a program. So um, where the systems are investing is they're investing heavily at the battleships, but they're also investing heavy, more heavily out in the hinterland and the communities with the idea that the people just cannot get uh, access. And so they've got to take the, the care to the patient. So uh, home is receiving an awful lot of emphasis. We have one client that's um, working now to be able to what they call the live home program where they can go live in uh, the people in their network, uh, all the patients that are in their network, they can go live into their home um, with various types of communication devices, all virtual, that um, there's instant communication. And so the, the system all the way through is able to follow on that network. So it's exactly the same thing that uh, Cindy is discussing. And as you all know, the VA has been trying to pioneer this for years uh, through the bureaucracy and to some degree, you know, have been successful, but many of the for-profit uh, companies, HCA and others are really taking it to another level. 
So some of the other questions that have been bouncing around in terms of people is, is how facilities in dealing with the issues of COVID should make sure that the environment is maintained safely. You and I talked uh, briefly about universal patient care rooms and nurse servers, and you talked earlier about uh, the use of automated guided vehicle systems. And I wonder what your thoughts are and perspectives are on those types of approaches given the pandemic and the impact on facilities going forward. Well, number one, obviously, is mechanical in getting the bad bugs out of the facility and preventing bad bugs from getting in. So by far, the number one priority of everyone is just getting their MEP systems up to date. So that's central energy plants, that's HEPA filtration, that's uh, UV lights, that's uh, exhaust systems, all of these sorts of things. So on a scale of 1 to 10, that would be a 10. Then as you go down to the seven and eights, uh, so an eight would be universal rooms with the theory that uh, everyone knows exactly what what goes in each room at what location. So there's an efficiency about that. And the staff has a, a staff zone that um, the HVAC is directly over the staff zone. So anything that the staff touches or handles can immediately go out into the atmosphere. Uh, ICU rooms, there's no such thing anymore as an ICU room. Every room is an ICU room. So all hospitals now are setting up um, their patient rooms to where they just flip some mechanical switches and all of a sudden they become an ICU. And then by telemetry or virtual, uh, any kind of IT program, they're able to monitor those beds from anywhere, frankly. Um, then in the departments, where we worked for the last 10 years to try to make the staff integrated with the patients. Now we're going back to having staff work areas that are separate from the patients. It's just bizarre. It's driving me nuts. And uh, so how do you then maintain that connectivity, personal connectivity to the staff in these high tent, highly stressful situations? It's really a trick. So those are the big ones. That's great. Thank you so much. Gene, do you have some questions that you'd like to bring up? I put the note out to everybody to please raise your hand so that we can get you on the uh, speaker and hear your questions and your perspectives in terms of building towards a secure future and would welcome anybody to have the opportunity to add their own perspectives. The chat room or the chat line or however you call the chat box is full of lots of comments from different people and they certainly range uh, a broad uh, spectrum of, of topics related to dealing with patients, emergency care patients and, and potentially infected patients at home or dealing with, with the issue of perspectives for the future. How do we design cities to fight future pandemics? And certainly, I think, Ben, you and I talked yesterday about uh, uh, Sukeli and his issues in designing uh, urbanization models when you were at Harvard and then subsequent to that, I think with the Roush facilities with Columbia, Maryland uh, experiment or experience and, and the success of that. So when you think about designing cities to fight future pandemics, does that tie into the placement of healthcare facilities? Ben? Yeah, absolutely. They're all integrated now. If you look at the prototype of Columbia, Maryland, that's exactly the way it was set. So 40 years ago, Sue Kelly was uh, promoting healthy design and healthy community planning, meaning inextricably linked and having preventative measures as part of the walking pathway systems and pedestrian movement systems and village greens and one-stop shops and having health centers on every corner. And uh, so all of that is in all the textbooks, you know, from 40 years ago. So now it's now based on the initiatives of, of this pandemic. And also I have to say some of the major storms, uh, the major hurricanes that have just leveled communities, uh, those two major paradigms are changing the world in terms of urban planning, city planning, health facility planning, integrated health care with prevention. So it's a whole new world out there. It's exciting. Yes, it is. Absolutely. One of the questions that Karen had asked was, 
from the attendees, do any of you have any specific facility structures that have worked well? For example, field hospitals or modification to the interface between ambulatory care facilities and the inpatient facilities. What lessons have you learned? So I'd put that question out for the group to, to feel free to raise your hand and chime into the discussion, please. Karen, would you like to add anything to that? Well, I will say, as I mentioned to you yesterday, uh, in terms of field facilities, from a facility point of view, they're very easy to do in 30 to 60 days max from nothing to something. The problem that we've had is the credentialing of the staff. And um, uh, because all of these systems are trying to work together and on state lines, moving from one state to the other or even one discipline to the other of how can a PA do this when she's not licensed to do that and that's where the big rubs have come for us. So uh, next week we're going to be looking at the regulatory environment particularly for human resources and what you raised is a, a really good uh, issue in terms of PAs and nurse practitioners but we also saw during this time some relaxation of some regulations relating to um, a provider of care to provider organizations, a certificate of need states and others. We've stood up um, kinds of uh, delivery settings that would have been very difficult before. I wonder if you think these will be sustained post COVID and what the implications of that is uh, for a future regulatory environment. You know, Gene, sure. it's Karen and I might jump in on this. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's a really important issue, and I think we're already starting to see kind of the the interdependencies between this issue and then next week at this time, we're going to be talking about, as you said, healthy workforce and staffing issues. And the third one is more about matching supply and demand. And then on the fourth Thursday, April 1st, we're going to be talking about kind of the interdependencies, interrelationships between all of these, really looking at it from a systems perspective. So um, hoping people can join that. I think there will be some interesting discussions related to the fact that different states have different licensing requirements, different qualifications when we start looking at advanced um, practitioners who are not physicians, like nurse practitioners, like PAs, it's different. Do we need to have more of a general standard across the entire United States like we do for doctors? There is a, um, a distributed ledger technology company called ProCredX that has been launched that's trying to address these issues so we're not duplicating efforts and possibly could go faster in an emergency to be able to credential somebody in one state who was credentialed uh, in another state. So just a couple of thoughts there. And to the question that that Dick had raised earlier, um, and I think this came from, um, I think it was Brent um, who had, had asked a question. I thought it was really good one because it talked about, you know, if you've got, you know, we hear about if there's a hurricane, like with Katrina, you know, you had this opportunity to rebuild and it's a great chance to just redesign things. But when you've got existing infrastructure, he was asking, you know, are there guidelines, are there resources when you need to retrofit something, which has got to be much, much harder. Yes, I think he talked about, Karen, he talked about Brent uh, in terms of standards for Eric's changes with the pandemic and for negative positive uh, airflows and what you have to do with a intensive care unit that is filled with COVID patients. And I don't know if there's any standards per se. There's probably some guidance from CDC. Ben, do you know? Yes, well, the Facility Design Institute, FGI guidelines, they have addressed this. Uh, we're trying through the American Society of Healthcare Architects, we're trying to get that pushed through CDC. You can imagine what an issue that is. Uh, NIH is behind it, so we've got the NIH behind it, and they are putting science uh, behind it and evidence behind it. But it's going to be a push haul, a long haul, and we're going to have many issues to deal with before it ever gets uh, uh, approved. So, uh, through our professional societies, we're really pushing very hard. Some states are very aggressive about it; others are 
pretty laid back about it. And uh, I think it's just going to be leadership exerted state by state to set the pattern to to get it going. Uh, Chicago is an example. In their urban areas there, they're being very aggressive about it because they've been so hard hit uh, by it. And there's a lot of evidence that's coming out of there as, as well as Mass General. You know, they're set up. Uh, for that, and they're producing a lot of white papers along those lines. But a lot of it boils down to no-brainers. You just have to go back and think about it. And I have a client that says, hey, Ben, your job is to get rid of the bad bugs. So we have to go figure out how to get rid of the bad bugs. <laughs> and it's, it, uh, it's the guiding principle now for everything. Other, other questions from the group, please. Now, let me just throw a comment in. This is I was the one that raised that question, and um, effectively what happened, so you kind of appreciate, there was air scrubbers all over the building, and um, without some, uh, you know, good knowledge, I, yeah, we're scrubbing the air, we're putting it outside the building, but we literally created a huge negative air space, and the and the external temperature of the of the community was, you know, radically affected the internal temperature of the building. So what we ended up with was during the winter, everything was really cold. During the summer, everything was really hot because we're sucking air through a HVAC system that wasn't designed to cool down the neighborhood. But there's so many, you know, um, air scrubbers throughout the building creating negative air in each one of those rooms. And uh, to me, it was like, you know, there was a lot of fear around putting scrubbed air back into the system. But to me, it seemed like y you just HEPA scrubbed it. You know, uh, and, and if it needs to be a higher level of scrub before it is allowed to be tapped back in and put into the system, um, it doesn't seem like it would be real hard. And so I can logic it out in my own mind and I would be comfortable putting a family member in, the, in that space or working in that space. But there, when there's a standard that some organization has said, this is acceptable, um, it's surprising how comforting that is to professionals. I mean, I had... Uh, nurses and doctors that would walk by the first floor um, where you had where we were venting HEPA scrubbed air out to the outside and they were nervous about walking on that walk that was you know still 15 20 feet away from that uh, from that COVID room so you know you can tell them as many times as you want but until somebody official says no this is okay we've tested it and it's acceptable you know response um, there's a lot of people that just have fear that they can't get over um, because they don't trust the guy in their building. Really appreciate you sharing your comments and perspectives, Brent. Perspectives from others? So, Dick, I'll go back just quickly to a point I was pursuing. 33 states suspended their certificate of need laws during COVID-19. Uh, those states... Um, uh, were significantly underbedded over time. Uh, in the U.S., we've gone from having about a million and a half beds to uh, close to a million. So we've we've lost a good number of our beds due to a variety of strategies. Uh, I, I wonder what folks see as the uh, policy implication of that. Uh, some of it due to bringing surgery outside of healthcare, uh, outside of hospitals, but others having to do with um, trying to regulate that uh, environment for uh, capability within institutions. Dick, this is Barbara Strain. I do have a question. These are all wonderful uh, processes people have put in place or some ideal states. Is there any... Um, discussion about where the payment and the costs for all of this and has that been worked up and how has that been received and those sorts of things? That's a great question. Ben and I talked about that a little bit yesterday in terms of the issues of reimbursement for this. So I'll just fill in uh, the space uh, just for a minute um, and and add something. You know, one, was, one of the things that was interesting, I listened to um, a session with the former CEO of Memorial Hermann, not too long, and I made a comment about this in the chat, not too long after the pandemic, um, you know, we'd gone through, I think, the first surge. 
And what he had suggested, you know, was there a tremendous opportunity for the um, executives with a variety of facilities to come together and decide, for example, in another pandemic, this hospital will be the COVID hospital and this hospital will be the place where people who need critical care can go. And so we've actually separated because we're triaging to different places. The challenge is, is that, so one place is doing things that generate revenue, someplace else is not. Um, and so it would seem to me that there would certainly be some accounting issues, but I would suspect there would also be some regulatory changes that would be required because of the different types of care and how you might account for that and how you might pay for that. Karen, it's Jim Eckler. Uh, that's exactly what the thought was with Ebola is that certain hospitals were going to become Ebola centers. Uh, but how that's managed is beyond me. How, who makes those tough decisions? We don't have a, a decision-making structure for that. Exactly, and that's the type of thing that you need to have those conversations now. You know, anytime you're in a crisis, you wanna kind of do those tabletop exercises, have those kinds of conversations. If this happens in this scenario, how we would do it, but, you know, there certainly would be, um, you know, more challenging regulatory drivers, particularly in the United States, as opposed to Canada, where, you know, you did um, a lot of your work. I think it might be a little easier. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I just think it's a little easier. Grass is always greener. Right. <laughs> but, um, uh, but if you think of Denny's uh, dimension, it's looking at this at a county level or a region level and creating a structure of decision makers of acute facilities, uh, that group would have the ability to do it and uh, presumably would come up with uh, appropriate uh, financial adjustments that, uh, as needed to do that. So uh, this goes right back to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the commons or the, the shared, uh, shared program that Denny was postulating. Well, and I think the other thing that's interesting in terms of Barbara's question about billing and, and reimbursement and structures around those lines are that the CMS recently, within probably the last two months, released four new uh, billing codes for telemedicine support for patients to uh, be linked to their physicians or group practices by telemedicine and then for that group practice for that physician to be able to bill for the services that were provided. And I think one of the difficulties we get into in terms of facilities, back to Barbara's main question was, how do you build in the costs for all of these changes that have been made to the healthcare facilities, whether it's uh, the Virginia Medical Center or Georgetown or MedStar or Hopkins or uh, Banner Healthcare Systems, you know, it's, it's, it's really, an astonishing amount of funds that have gone into keeping the systems afloat and being able to get through the surges of the pandemic. And I think there is yet to be clarity in terms of how these changes will be reimbursed or at least made possible to make the healthcare facilities whole once again. And I think that's what you were talking about, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, hey, Dick, I've got um, just a, maybe a question of interest for my own sake. Uh, as, as you know, and, and Karen and Jean know, I'm, I'm not from the health sector. I, I just joined to lead CAPS Research a couple of months ago. I came out of financial services. I uh, led MasterCard's global real estate portfolio. And I'm always interested because a lot of companies in a lot of sectors, especially from the real estate and facilities, have an environmental focus right now. And I know, you know, in, in our talking points, cybersecurity uh, and some other certifications and credentialing, but how does the environment, when I think of, of waste reduction and, you know, thinking just of how much waste may be generated in the facilities, uh, overall lead and, and other environmental, how, how is that playing in, in this sector? Just again, more, more for my own knowledge than... <laughs> Yeah, uh, Brian, this is Gene. I mean, it's, uh, and I spent some time looking at these things. It, uh, first, it's a tremendous uh, problem. I think that the uh, products used in COVID-19 are very high level pollutant 
uh, you know, the, the number of plastics, the amount of plastics is just astronomical. Uh, I was on a call yesterday about how to reprocess those uh, or how to not reprocess those, although some of them you can, but basically how to uh, um, deal with those from an environmental perspective. Uh, and, and, and it's just huge and it hasn't been addressed. I, I think that um, one of the things that you see across the healthcare system is a huge interest in uh, reprocessing items. So I don't know if there's anyone on from Banner. Uh, Banner went from using paper gowns to using cloth gowns, uh, given the number, which again is sort of a environmental issue. Uh, but it's one that's uh, clearly top of mind to uh, being able to, uh, to deal and to, to work with. Uh, Jane, are they are are the systems? Are they at least measuring waste yet, or or would that just be? Are they just kind of moving to just maybe generally best practices and and, and not showing? I, I don't think that. Yeah, at, at this point, there's not a clear measure of waste. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, one of the discussions, and there's several very large RFPs out right now to uh, look at. Uh, at, at these kinds of issues. And I think some spurred by, you know, you can't go for a walk without seeing masks on the ground today, uh, which, which is really interesting. I mean, they're the new uh, uh, pollutant. Uh, ASU has a lab which went from using wipes to uh, using uh, uh, gathering uh, samples uh, and has moved to straws. And again, so it brings more plastic in uh, because frequently, previously, we were using uh, wood and, and other products. And so there's a lot of concern about it. And um, uh, just think of all of the glass that's being used for all of the, um, the vaccines. Uh, there's a huge shortage right now of um, uh, clinical quality glass to be able to have, but there's also huge waste associated with that glass and being able to reprocess uh, those glass in some ways. If I can add on to that, because um, this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart, uh, I did post an article um, in the chat that addresses exactly what Jean was just talking about. Um, I did have a chance, I was invited by the United Nations to speak at a pre-event to the G20 summit on specifically on sustainability in healthcare. And one of the things I find really interesting is the UK has said it will be carbon neutral by 2050. And as part of that, they have determined that the NHS, the National Health Service, is one of the largest contributors to the carbon footprint. And as part of that, they are looking at unwarranted care. So you've seen those studies that, you know, a third of care that's delivered is, um, is either unwarranted, unnecessary, or actually potentially harmful. And so they're looking at things on how can they prevent, for example, you know, a prescription to a patient that the patient doesn't need that. And they're actually doing research to look at their carbon footprint because 60% of the carbon footprint for the NHS is related to supply chain. And they're looking very, very broadly. And they're actually looking at what is that carbon footprint all the way upstream related to those products and services that they are using in the delivery of care and trying to reduce. So, you know, one of the things that I said when I was speaking to that group was, you know, do we need more product? Certainly in a pandemic, we absolutely. But do we need better product? You know, do we need to design masks that are different? Can we build product that isn't made out of plastic, um, though, or that doesn't have as much environmental degradation when we are trying to, um, to reprocess or to disintegrate? Um, um, to get rid of it, to burn the waste, et cetera, or to recover the energy from that. Um, and ideally, you know, if we're really trying to produce optimal health, ideally we need no product at all because the patient never got sick. So we, you know, thinking about it very, very broadly. That's a holistic perspective. Wow. I think we'll probably have to come back and, and pursue that a little bit more further downstream. Amber, you've had your hand up for a long time. And I really want to give you the, the opportunity. You're, you're unmuted. And please feel free to speak up. Amber Bolas. Hi. Uh, you know, I hate to take us away from the topic that we're on because, Karen, that's incredibly um, 
compelling. And I, I hope that we do come back to that. And so I'm going to switch gears on us um, since we've kind of been uh, in this direction. But one of the, the things that I wanted to ask the group, and I do apologize if I touch on something that was covered, I had to step away for a couple of minutes. Um, I really was thinking about the, the changes that have had to occur in order for, for all of us to provide care and all of the different things that we've talked about on, on the, the call today are really interesting and compelling to me. And I was wondering if there is um, knowledge of or, or even um, communication coming out, and I, and I just don't know this, and so I'm hoping someone can share with me, around changes in um, some of the accrediting or organizations that exist, you know, are they looking at some of these areas and maybe even from the perspective of what we were just talking about green initiatives and things like that, but are we thinking that the things that occurred over the last year that really made us look long and hard at our infrastructure will shift and change the way that some of those bodies look at organizations when they come in for their accreditation? Amber, this is Gene. I'm involved in a number of accreditations, and uh, one is health management education. Uh, and, and I would comment that uh, very few health management programs around the country have a course in supply chain management. And so most healthcare organizations are led by a CEO who really has no idea of what's happening uh, within that environment. And so we're trying to work with the accrediting commission to increase that in a number of ways. Um, uh, Regina Herzl and I have been working with CAMI, which is the accrediting commission, to increase the, no the content, uh, not just in supply chain, but also in innovation, because so much of what happened in telemedicine and other areas that we've talked about have to do with innovation and very little. So we've spent a lot of time talking about managing the system as it is, but not managing the system under points of disruption. So that, that's one area that's important. Uh, secondly, uh, Carolyn Compton's, I, I hope Carolyn is still on, because what we've seen is uh, in standing up the lab here at ASU that does testing uh, for the university, but does testing for many other entities uh, in, in the uh, Phoenix area. Uh, we, we've seen the lab, uh, we've seen uh, Clea having to deal with new organizations coming in, and Carolyn might comment on how Clea has responded. I don't know if she's with us still. I don't know if Carolyn's still on or not. I can't see her right now, but I'm thinking one of the other topics we talked about in terms of, of the whole issue of certification is that issue of crossing state lines with the pandemic and having physicians provide telemedicine support and certifications and accreditation across state lines. And I think that has been moved somewhat, but it still is, a, is an issue that is ongoing and hasn't been resolved fully. While there has been some waivers of that for dealing with the pandemic, the question is how is that going to change in terms of state accreditation facilities and certification facilities going forward? I put the slide back up to remind everybody that we do have an additional three sessions and some of these topics may be uh, addressed in those sessions going forward. And, and I'm pleased to note that Dr. Cortez has joined us. Denny, welcome aboard. Any perspectives from your side since you just jumped in? <laughs> That's the best time to give perspectives because you don't have any clue what you all talked about. <laughs> but no, I no perspectives now. I'm just sitting here listening. And if something comes up that I might be able to add to, I will. Okay, thank you. Carolyn Compton, you're back on. And, and Gene, I think, just mentioned your name and, and asked if you had perspectives on what he was just talking about. Yes, I do, uh, actually. So I'm the medical director of the, the ASU Biodesign Clinical Testing Laboratory. It is a clinical testing laboratory now that we have um, our certification from CLIA and went forward very, very precipitously at the beginning of the pandemic when the commercial laboratories were actually swamped and they were so backlogged in their testing for the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus that 
uh, they were returning results in a 10-day turnaround time frame. And that, of course, is useless in the middle of a pandemic. Not only do you need to have the correct result, you need to have it returned in a very timely fashion to be able to identify infected individuals, pull them out of the trajectory of, of, of transmission, um, and quarantine them in order to flatten the curve and to, to, to change the trajectory. Um, uh, of the pandemic. So we were able to step up very quickly um, because there were, there were experts at ASU um, that were doing other things, but dropped their day jobs in order to step up to meet this challenge. I think there, there was a lot of goodwill. There was the support of President Crow, and there just happened to be the right expertise on the staff to be able to do it. Um, I, we're, we're now in, in, in discussions about what, what will happen um, after all of this effort um, to put this, this operation together in a university that does not have a medical school, that does not have a hospital to be able, and has never done clinical testing before. Um, this is really quite spectacular and it was no small feat, but to let it lapse now be, uh, toward the end of the pandemic, should the funding from the state and other partners um, fade with the fading of the pandemic. Um, it seems uh, a lost opportunity to have something like this um, be supported on, a, uh, on a, a level which will allow it to maintain its accreditation um, and be on the shelf, so to speak, if needed to be able to move into action. So that's the way I see it from my point of view. It's unclear um, uh, how this will play out. Carolyn, Carolyn this is Denny, to... uh, Richard. I'd like to make a comment on it and pull something out further from Carolyn, if I can. Please. Uh, <clears throat> if, we, if we push that back to even earlier in this particular pandemic, Carolyn, um, re recall there were organizations that had the wherewithal to do this, that were giving care to patients and academic centers that had hospitals and, and, and uh, research organizations um, related to healthcare that were prevented, prevented from creating any tests by the FDA and the CDC. If you remember, that's how it really was messed up. So to answer your question, I think, will require some policy issues. And that probably would be at the national level because I could see the exact same thing happening again, power and control, central level, because we all frequently default to think the government is gonna solve problems quickly when we can't figure out a way to do it. But when they default to that thinking, they also exert their power to prevent others from stepping up. And we lost a good bit of time because of that. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Is that this, this is not just a local issue. This is a larger, larger issue, I think. Well, the reason that we were successful quite clearly was that we piggybacked onto Thermo Fisher's already having attained a, an emergency use authorization for their platform. So all we did was just use their EUA, we just piggybacked onto that. And we were really waived from having to get our own uh, self-standing EUA. And that really fast-tracked everything. The, the, the next big um, change was the, the changeover from nasopharyngeal swabs. And that made a huge difference for everyone. I think you remember that at the beginning, um, the, the FDA and the CDC, everybody had only um, been giving guidance about the use of nasopharyngeal swabs for diagnosis. And that required full PPE. It required medical people to be uh, acquiring those samples. It was, it was very cumbersome, very labor intensive. Um, and we didn't have um, the swabs. We couldn't get the, the, the right, uh, this is a supply chain issue. We couldn't, we couldn't get uh, the right um, supplies to be able to do that. Uh, at least we didn't have infinite supplies. We were always worried about running out. So when we switched specimen type, when we got authorization to be, and, and we piggybacked again on someone else's because Yale did this first. So switching from nasopharyngeal swabs 
two saliva specimens showing that they were equivalent if the in many cases the saliva specimens were better um so that precluded any PPE. It made acquisition of specimens much easier. The specimens were very stable. And, and so we could collect them in other settings besides the ones that we had to set up and train for and man um, at the beginning of the pandemic. So there were, again, uh, this was all fast tracked, but we took advantage of other people clearing the way through their acquisition of uh, emergency use authorizations. Well, and, and those people who created those emergency use authorizations that you, you leveraged upon yeah. once you were able to get started, but they were delayed because ah. of, the, of the inaction or the wrong action at the governmental level. And I'm just wondering, can you see policy implications that it is, is imperative to really create a much better streamlined supply chain? Uh, there's no point in launching the creation of bullets, uh, you know, 10 years after the war has started. Uh, you got to be able to do it pretty quickly. And if we're into this early, they should be looking for all the help we can get. And, and these labs were already CLIA approved labs to begin with. Oh, yeah. To start with. Yes. So I don't we, see why so we, we took so long. That's right. So we were dealing with, I mean, CLIA is all about the environment within which you are doing the test. It has nothing to do with the test itself. That's right, an right. FDA thing. So we were dealing with both. So we had the, the, the FDA and its view of the test that we were doing. It was a laboratory developed test, but, but Thermo Fisher, we were using Thermo Fisher equipment and Thermo Fisher already had emergency use authorization. So that moved along quickly, but but the CLIA certification was no small issue because that has to do with all kinds of standardized um, measurements that you have to take and you have to set up training programs and you have to document everything and it has to be. And we also had to set up a, um, an information handling system um, that was HIPAA compliant. And, and there was only one HIPAA compliant server in all of the ASU, and it was out of the Johnson building. It was not built for cl a clinical purpose. It was for population research. So we had to jury rig everything. It was, we had a lot of balls in the air. And, and hopefully the next time um, we will already have learned how to juggle and, and we can just um, move right into action. Well, what would happen, I noticed Karen wrote a note there too, but I'd like to hear what Karen's thought is, is about this. But what I'm trying to get at is, is there something like a legislative move or some kind of a dictate that under emergencies uh, that CLIA approved labs can move ahead to do what they think they need to do? Something that's stupid, but just let them go and not, not wait until the CDC figures out what they're doing uh, because the CDC has very little knowledge about this kind of stuff. They're supposed to do public health and epidemiology, not create tests and stuff. Uh, so I just wonder, I don't know, Karen, what do you think? Because you made the issue about uh, scenario planning and things. So I, that, how, because this to me is a, the trigger point, you got to get started faster. And how do we do that? Absolutely. And I think there's so many different ways that we can do this. I, um, you know, I've spent most of my life in healthcare, but I left for a while and went into the energy industry where occasionally people blew things up. And so we, I was in charge of a lot of our crisis communications and planning. And, and the most valuable thing was coming together for these tabletop exercises, identifying who needed to be involved in that, all those intricacies. And you can do it at multiple levels. Denny, just like you're doing with this group of eight, um, hospitals, you know, you're working with the CEOs, but you're working with the facilities folks and the HR folks and the supply chain folks. And even if it's just coming together and understanding who the different players are, but if you can make those kinds of decisions that under these scenarios, we allow this. So we're not figuring out the emergency use authorizations on the fly, because as clinicians, you know, you know, in emergency care, it's that you know, seconds count. And so the faster we can respond, we can't figure out everything, we can't anticipate everything, but even going through the process, you've started to meet the other people, you start knowing what agencies, what jurisdictions, you have at least figured that out. 
and we can all move faster. Yeah, well, you would think we might be able to learn. Remember the Fukushima accident that occurred in, in uh, Japan. Fundamentally was part, what's that? 2011. Yeah, 2011. 2011. But, but if, if you're gonna learn anything from it, one of the learnings was that the people on site had the knowledge and the capability of shutting down the plant much earlier, but they required permission from the, the I don't know, the president of the, of the club or somebody at a national level having to do with, with, uh, with whatever it was, and they couldn't get a hold of the person. It's kind of what happened on D-Day when they couldn't get a hold of Hitler. The Germans, they, they were being rushed on, but they, they couldn't call Hitler. So the Germans sat there. They had a million people sitting in Calais. We were really lucky to pull it off. But, but this kind of a top-down control is exactly what we hit here with the need for testing. We had delivery organizations ready to start the testing, but we were asleep at the switch at the federal level to give the permission that they shouldn't have had to give. These, were or, these are organizations whose job is to take care of sick people and to do it in a way, if it's an emergency, they have to respond in an emergency. So we, you, we just, the country just cannot afford to wait for somebody to get a committee together to sit down to say, okay, we'll let somebody else make a decision instead of just saying, go. Then they catch up to do their regulatory oversight, make sure it's being done well and all that sort of thing. But I think we lost a huge opportunity to get an awful lot of data collected. And frankly, we're still doing it right now because we're not collecting gene, genomic data on the patients that are uh, on a standard basis like they are in the UK. The UK has a lot more genetic data. Yeah. So I think, well. I think, Karen, put on your list that th this, is a, this raises a policy issue, I think, that has to be brought somewhere because we can all try to do something as much as we can. But if you get the FDA sends a letter and says you can't do something, then okay, now what do we do? Who do we blame? You know, <laughs> we got to be clear who we're blaming here. Well, and I also think, Denny, it crosses the boundaries in terms of several of the federal agencies. You talked a little bit about ASPR, the, the uh, Assistant Secretary for Emergency Preparedness under HHS and how that ties into it. And certainly CMS and, and the issues of doing research from Carolyn's perspective and HIPAA and the HIPAA requirements and, and making sure that people provide consent and they understand what they're signing up for on a timely basis. But then you've also got the CDC in there. So all of those things being pulled together in a regulatory framework and in a structure that provides an outline for us when we get past the pandemic and deal with future emergency disasters where you pull in FEMA or whomever it might be, is a really important topic. Karen, back to you. I have a comment, Dick, if that's it. okay. Yeah, absolutely. So we even need to take it even back further and it doesn't even have to be, you know, the actual pandemic or hurricane or whatever we're talking about. It really even goes back to raw materials that we have seen across the board over a number of years. It just happened to be very heightened during COVID because some of those raw materials were like for making nitrile gloves, which were in demand. But I think if we have a good signaling system that can then alert key folks to say, here's what's going on, and you have about two weeks or three weeks or whatever until things are constrained. So start now to do these things. And so it doesn't even have to be a pandemic or whatever. It's what's going on today. And I think there's enough either artificial intelligence or other data or other earmarks where all these sort of uh, the top 20, you know, raw materials, where are they going? Um, I think these are important issues that we can solve with a lot of, you know, computer and software and electronic means. Uh, so Barbara, Maybe Brian could comment on this because I, I think other industries, as we've seen uh, through CAPS, have done a much better job mm -hmm. of working with tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers. 
I mean, mm-hmm. and, and, and we've seen some new companies come into this to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, I think it's an area where I, I think we've seen other industries. Uh, GM just does an amazing job of tracking and tracing its, its upstream suppliers, where we've hardly touched that. But mm-hmm. can, I, can I interject a, another facet to that question, Gene? And that is, and I, I'd call on, on Dr. Compton for this one because um, I, I don't know enough to, 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 to form an opinion on it. But when I did look at some of the issues around testing turnaround and issues with shortages of supplies like reagents, you know, learning that, you know, different, we have all of these different tests. And this this platform needs to use this reagent and this platform needs to use this. Is there a reason why that is better for us or would we be better off with something that was more standardized where we had more flexibility, if you will, to use different kinds of components or products? As I said, I don't know enough to know if that's a good idea or a bad idea. Um, So uh, that's a... That's a, a loaded question, actually. Um, I, I, um, but I, I do have some thoughts about that very thing. And that is that I think on the, on the laboratory level, there are two things that laboratories must do, and even in regular patient care, but, but certainly in a pandemic. You've got to get the right answer and you've got to get the right answer quickly so that the, the latter is much more important in a pandemic or, or the answer is useless, even if you've got the right answer. And getting the right answer is, a, is an issue that is related to being able to show, not to anybody else necessarily, but to yourself, that, you, that the test that you're doing and the, the standard operating procedures that you're using are yielding the correct answer, that when the patient is really um, free of disease, you're getting a negative test result. And when the patient has the disease, you're getting a positive result. So it's the positive and negative, what we call predictive value. This is lab talk for the test performance. And one of the, one of the problems that we had in even standing up our tests, even though we were using a platform that already had an EUA and we were regularly in conversation with Thermo Fisher, Um, is that we had trouble getting the right um, control specimens. In other words, you you have to have some specimens that you test your platform with that are known to be positive and some specimens that are known to be negative. So they are knowns and you test, you you challenge your testing um, with these known um, specimens and and, and this and a certain number of them. So the statistical significance is showing you that you can have a high degree of confidence that you're not getting false positives, that you're not getting false negatives. And that gives you the positive and negative predictive value. So it's really important that we be able to get our hands on these specimens so, so that we can test our own uh, platforms, even without getting government approval or, or what you're suggesting and you know somebody else is smiling on your on on your platform um if you're able to get the right answer using different tubes using modifications of the platform whatever it is that you need to do but you still need those those positive and negative controls and we had trouble getting them And I think there needs to be that the labs need to be linked together. They need to be networked together, both both commercial labs, academic labs, public and private sector, so that we can get our hands on the things that we need to do good laboratory science and and generate the data. Forget about pleasing anyone else, please ourselves that we know that we are generating the correct answer. So to to. To Jean's question then, you know, or we're talking about supplies, is that the kind of thing that you can use those control specimens, I would suspect, in any platform? Well, you could, yes. Yeah. Because so that's, being able that's to the yardstick that. of truth, right? We know that those specimens have been tested and tested. We know the true answer um, uh, of, of the status of those specimens. So you're challenging your own platform, your own tests, your own procedures um, to, to get that answer. Um, and, and, and you need to 
to do that or there there's no point in you entering the testing arena because a, a bad answer is going to lead to a bad decision so yeah but so even a good kind of, answer done too slowly is no good either right but that would create that kind of network and that visibility yes. the same thing that gene was talking about yes. but it's just a different kind of putting it on its side if you will yeah, we have to leave our competitiveness behind and we have to share those samples and we have to share our knowledge to be able to meet the emergent situation. We weren't Carolyn, has Carolyn had a chance to describe some of the work she's been doing to deal with just the handling of specimens in routine supply chain fashion for the way we take care of patients normally, not even in an emergency situation? I don't know if you had any mentioned of that, but it's a tough, it's a tough hole because we got to teach an awful lot of people the importance of behaving in a supply chain mindset. But Carolyn's been leading this effort for years now. Is that right? Carolyn? Yes. Yes. So I'm about to get across the goal line here with the College of American Pathologists to enforce this through their laboratory accreditation program. But the truth is that a CLIA lab is responsible not only for the analysis piece of a test, but they're responsible patient to patient, um, the handshake, in other words, from the time the specimen comes out of or off of the patient till it gets to the lab, till it gets analyzed, till the results get returned to the patient, the lab's responsible under CLIA. So the, what, what happens before the specimen arrives at the lab is called the pre-analytic period. And, and so in this pandemic, we had a lot of pre-analytic challenges because you were basically collecting specimens in tents in the desert in the summer in Arizona. So the, the, even if you have the perfect test, and the perfect platform, you can get the wrong answer if you bugger up the specimen you're testing. And that's the whole point. So you have to um, be able to have the knowledge about the stability of the specimen. You have to train people to collect those specimens, transport them in a way that will maintain their integrity so that the molecules you're testing for in the specimen um, on your on your great platform with your great test will yield the right answer. And we had all kinds of challenges with that. And, and that's another thing where I think we need, well, we need this in regular medicine as Denny's been working with me long notes because there are all kinds of standards. CLIA is the perfect example of hardcore standards by which all laboratories um, are judged and must obey that have to do with the people doing the test, the platform they're testing, the um, all the reagents that you're that they're, you're using. Um, all of this has to be carefully documented and controlled. Whereas the very thing that you're testing is not required to be controlled at all. There are no standards for this right now. And furthermore, it's not even required that you record what happened to it. So basically when a specimen arrives in, in, a, in a medical laboratory, it's, if I can use the term mystery meat, um, it, it, you have no idea what happened to it um, because there are no requirements to control and, and with molecular medicine, precision medicine, this is everything because it's going to be the molecular test you do on that specimen that is going to dictate all downstream management of the patient and without any other input from the clinician or the patient's chart or anything. So this is becoming a huge issue. We have to guarantee that what we're doing in the pre-analytic phase is going to maintain the molecular integrity from the patient to the laboratory, get the right, do the right test um, to get the right answer and return it to the patient um, in, in a HIPAA compliant fashion. So we have, it, it's putting together all of these pieces and, and we had no knowledge of I mean, we had to do the tests ourselves to um, convince ourselves that um, the way we were handling the specimens through these drive-through sites that we'd set up were, were actually um, yielding stable specimens. And we weren't 
destroying the molecules in those specimens that we were going to test for by just the way we were collecting or handling them. So there's it, this is more complicated than just control of the environment in the laboratory, is the control of the environment upstream as well. So, hey, well, Dr. Thompson, I think one of the things that you mentioned there is, is really insightful in, in what we've got. You know, again, from an, as an outsider's perspective here, what I'm, what I'm hearing an opportunity, especially when Carolyn's speaking and some of the questions that, Carolyn, or that Karen had and the way Jean uh, followed up with Barbara, it, I, I think there's a, a, a data transparency opportunity in this sector significantly. So, I mean, standards is, is, is one thing. I think that's great. But it, it also sounds like the data capture, the data transparency, I mean, up and down the chain. I mean, in this, in this world, I mean, many, many other industries are just, they're being very um, free and transparent. I mean, obviously with IP considerations, but anything that, that's helping the community in general, there's just a, a huge issue on or an opportunity on transparency. So it's, it's interesting to hear this. I appreciate, I appreciate the discussion we've had. Great discussion today. And we are grateful for all your participation. Thank you.